ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, broadcast of the Weekly Beat. Uh, my name is Dumi Jere, and today I'm coming to you from Port Elizabeth in South Africa. Uh, with me, obviously, my beautiful sister, Maggie Mutesi, uh, coming to us from uh, Dakar. Let's start with you, Maggie. How are you doing? You well? I'm doing fantastic. It's a beautiful morning and, you know, business as usual. Indeed, indeed. Help me to welcome our lovely guest from Kigali in Rwanda, Mr. Henry Nyakarundi. How are you doing, brother? I'm fine, Dumi, and, and uh, thanks for having me, huh? Maggie, also, as always. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's been quite a long journey. I'm like, I've been speaking to him for the past, what, seven years? Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it, it's, you know, as I grow, I'm like, okay, Henry, now let's speak about this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it's, 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 a, it's a pleasure to have you, Henry, and uh, we're looking forward to learning more um, from your world of uh, startups and scaling startups and how the terrain has been and what you have found. Uh, so I'm not going to do much of the introduction of uh, exactly who you are, except to just say uh, Henry is the founder of ARED. Uh, which is a startup focusing on green solutions in uh, Rwanda. I hope I got that correct. But we're going to hear more anyway. And if I missed something, he's going to uh, 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 help us and uh, fill in some more information. But uh, I think let's just uh, kick it off. Uh, oh, sorry, before we kick it off, uh, salutes to all the women in Africa. Uh, we're, still, uh, we're still in uh, Women's Month, so hey. It'll be a miss to start the show without <laughs> recognizing. And I know Maggie is smiling. <laughs> Salutes to you and many other Thank you, uh, women out there. Um, Henry, let me start uh, before I uh, before we get into what you folks do at ARED. Let me start with this question. How do you see uh, the African landscape with particular regards to women entrepreneurs? Do you think they find it easier? or it's much harder for them, uh, one, whether it's raising finance, I mean, raising capital or dealing with VCs. Do guys have it easier or do women have it easier? From your take, what do you think, brother? No, they, they definitely don't have it easier. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, women are on, on, the, on, the, on the startups, um, scale they're at the bottom unfortunately uh, of the food chain and um the reason are many i mean i you know i i think most the the, the biggest problem is they're not taken seriously right um they're not taken seriously uh, a lot of investors don't believe they can achieve big things it varies it varies and then we have women have still the stigma in africa as much as we want to change that there's still that stigma of what a woman role should be. Uh, mm. But it is changing, but it varies per country. I like what Rwanda have done in the woman space, for sure, in Rwanda, mm -hmm. but it varies per country, for sure. Mm. And and obviously, Dumi, I'm sorry, you, you started this. I'm just going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> I knew, I knew I started a war. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, think, I, I, think, I, think, I think for me, um, uh, Henry has put it so uh, plain, really. Um, it's never easy, but I, again, um, even even in a country like Rwanda, where we see policy policies that basically are put in place to support the women, so that they are actually able to work in environments that accept them or even uh, cater for their growth, the society still has that um, belief in them, or there is still that society expectations of what women should do in terms of work. Even hard jobs, I mean, there are sectors where you barely find women, unless if they are, you mm. know, the, 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 the informal workers. Even in the mining sector, for example, you will find them as the guys who are down below the, the rider. But definitely, there is so much work to do. There are strides that are being made. And uh, I think when we kick off conversations like this and we just throw it in, for me, I think at the end of the day, it's about mm. um, speaking about some of these issues and making people understand that it's not just women to really fight fight for their space but your support do me henry's support and everybody's support really matters because you cannot unlearn 
30 years or 40 years of saying this is how you should be in just in just 10 years so there's also that internal battle and 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 we need the support so let me not say so much because it's, it's, it's a different topic <laughs> indeed indeed indeed, no, I, indeed i just want to add something go, quickly go ahead, go ahead. Hey. yeah yeah i just want to add and I, I, first of all shout out to my mom because I, I became my entrepreneurship skills came from my mom by the way and hey. I, you know my, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, she, she was a hustler of the family. And, uh, but the story she used to tell me used to blow my mind. And I, I feel like, yes, time I've changed, but how she, you know, nobody in business, like for, she, she used to have a farm where she still has, and she couldn't go there to talk to the farmer. She had to send a man and, mm -hmm. and tell him to pretend that he's the owner of the farmer, uh, of the farm to talk to the farmers, right? Because they wouldn't talk to her. They wouldn't even believe because she was telling me also to get a deed as a woman, you know, was very difficult, almost impossible. So man, Imagine you that. know, it, it's crazy, man. That's why every time I have a challenge and I tell that people all the time, every time I have a challenge, I just think about what she went through and I realize my problems are very small, man. They're very <laughs> small. <you know? laughs> And let's keep you it know, with you, Henry. Let's keep it with you. Uh, uh, um, the journey of uh, Ared. Where did it start from? Uh, just take us through briefly, like, how did it start? Where did you go? And uh, to finding up, to coming up with this solution. Why Rwanda? Why not Kenya? Why not Uganda? Why not uh, any other country? Well, what was the thought process? Yeah, so, so Ared was an idea that came about uh, in a time where around 2009 uh, i was tired yeah. of living in the us it was time for me to i wanted to come back home i was looking for a project and uh, i i was thinking about what what can i do uh, back home and initially the a red idea was initially around energy it, it evolved now to different things but initially it was around energy <laughs> and i was going through uh, a, a breakdown you know I, I was just tired man i was tired of, of the west i felt like it was time for me to move back and Rwanda was, uh, so initially was not Rwanda, actually, it was Burundi. I grew up in Burundi. Uh, really? With refugees okay. there. Yeah, 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 oh, wow. yeah. I grew up there. And, uh, and so initially was in Burundi. I went to Burundi. It was chaos. I was like, nah. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I love, man, I love that country, man. <laughs> to this day. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I was like, yo, man, this is. You know, going happening. from the West, from the U.S. to Burundi, that, that, that was that was too much. That was just too much. I was like, nah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, yo, the stuff I was seeing, I was like, no, nah, that, that ain't going to happen. Man. Gonna happen. <laughs> so, All right. So I was like, uh, so I was like, let me try Rwanda. You know, I never lived in Rwanda. The first time yeah. I came to Rwanda was in 96 for a month. I didn't know Rwanda. Yeah. Uh, but I like what were happening early, so I moved back in in 2013, Jan 2013. So mm -hmm. I, I remember RDB was popping and all those things, and it was very interesting because that idea of RDB was very unique in Africa. So I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? Uh, let me try Rwanda. I'm Rwandan. It's always easiest. A lot of time we think it's easier to start where you from originally, but yeah. Uh, yeah. you know it was not as easy as I thought it was, but structurally it was the best place to start something on the structure yeah. and, and legal side rwanda is very good for that you know there's very little corruption things are more in line to what i was accustomed to in the us and that's why i started yeah. and yeah I, I looked at other countries as as what would be the expansion plan but the base was a nice a place where i wanted where i can test certain things mm. and have an idea of certain things without having to worry about bribe and all this stuff and all and Rwanda was the best place did did it did it did it actually play out the way you want it for you because uh, i just understand Rwanda is a small market in terms of your your your, your company at the time uh did it play out the way you wanted because i also feel like a lot of times that as entrepreneurs you know or startup founders they struggle with you know where do i start which market would actually work best for my you know for my idea or for my business yeah, so it depends. Um, for looking now, back in hindsight, um, 
for example, I'll give you some example. If you want to look for investor, Rwanda is not the best place to be in because investors are going to look at Rwanda as a very small market unless you show that you've already expanded and, and then you show that your product is scalable. Um, so, but Rwanda was very good at testing um, the thesis we had, uh, you know, about our products and, and mm. getting feedback from customers and all those things. But there was a lot of challenges for sure. You know, um, the biggest challenge that I've seen in Rwanda is the mindset. And I always say that we don't have the entrepreneurial mindset. It's improving a little bit. Uh, now I've been here nine years, but the biggest challenge was mindset. So I'll give you an example. It's very well structured. Absolutely. But when you go, you cannot do anything without some type of permits or license and all those things, because everything is well. You have to do things following the laws. That's great. But the problem is we, you, you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to get access to permits and all from people who've never been in business. They don't understand that this is your business. This is how you live. So I can tell you examples where, you know, they made me wait. To, some, some permits took six months. <laughs> You know, uh, dudes like, yo, one dude, I remember the PS of the man was like, yo, why, why you come here every day? You need to chill. Literally, this is what the guy is telling me. I, I chill need to with chill. My business, my food, every minute counts, you know. And I, I was blown away, you know, but, you know, and then, so, so those are the things that I, you know, I, I was not, a, I, I didn't like things didn't move fast enough. For me. But, but um, to cut you, cause I, I know Dumi also operates in, um, in this space. Isn't that literally one of the challenges you face across Africa? Because when you speak to a lot of people, they will say, oh, operating in Nigeria is hell. You don't know about your business survivor the next day or this, this, it's like there are always those small, small challenges. And I, I mean, for me, it's like, okay, Rwanda is structured, it gives you the platform, but also there's a country like Nigeria, which has the mass, the masses, but you know, you could lose everything in just a second. I mean, and then, you know, do me, you're in SA, we're probably structured. And then on the other hand, there's probably that entrepreneurial mindset. I, I, I don't know. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, uh, obviously it's, yes, the base is South Africa. However, if you want to expand, um like for example we we had to set base in uh in eswatini and it was pretty much the same things where you gotta wait for some permit for the next three months next six months it pushes your timelines out and by the time everything is now in place it's now december everybody is closed so it's it's um it's a whole <laughs> lot of uh up and down so, so so i get it and i understand it um but if, we, we obviously uh, expanded to other countries and ARED, uh, according to my understanding, also ended up um, expanding to other countries. What, 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 what would you say uh, are some of the biggest misconceptions that exist around uh, startups as well as uh, the African uh, speed, uh, or African landscape of doing business when it comes to startups from your experience in expanding to the other countries? Which, other, which countries are they, by the way? Yeah, so we we in Uganda, we in Ethiopia, we in uh, Burkina Faso, we in Ivory Coast, and Nigeria right. is actually our next market. Uh, COVID kind of slowed that down, but uh, but yeah. So first thing is uh, partnership. I always tell people don't try to expand. I've seen too many companies folding because they're trying to expand themselves, set up shop in all those countries. <laughs> your your burn rate. You're gonna spend so much money. Because again, you can go to Uganda and because it's a neighboring country to Rwanda, but doing business there is totally different than Rwanda, yeah. right? Um, Burundi, totally different. And yet we, we neighbor, you know, we neighbor, we have a lot of, but you, again, the mindset, the way to do business and all that is totally different. So yeah. you need to work through partnership model. That's just the only way you're going to build a sustainable model. Now that obviously changed based on what type of business you have. But, you know, overall partnership, because the market in Africa is so fragmented, you know, it's slow to try to uh, uh, set up shop and open shop uh, in all those countries and, and, and trying to implement your business by yourself. You're going to get burned. As you mentioned, Nigeria is totally, you know, I've been in Nigeria now for the last uh, two and a half years, going there every six months. 
And, um, and by the way, Nigeria is my favorite market. Now for the size. I've never met a Nigerian that even when they have a job, doesn't have three or four businesses on the side. Their <laughs> mindset. It's I agree. So They're hustlers. I business. agree. Man, they, hustlers. they yo, from sun up to sun down. Those guys <laughs> hustle, man. I love that, man. I, I love that culture. Man. I love that hustle. You know. <laughs> so it's like they're the hustlers playbook, oh you know. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then yo, in every terms night, of, uh, yeah. Nigerian I talk. I talked to. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. All right. Sorry. I was. I was saying yes, and I agree with that. Uh, with that Nigerian sentiment. I mean, all you have to do is just go and sit, even in the lobby of a hotel in Leki or in Nikoi or wherever, and you just see people coming in and out, meetings happening, and it's 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 yeah, I don't, it's infectious. That's the word I want to use. Yeah, it is. That that brings me to something I've always wondered for a very long time. Doesn't mean that um um because because let's face it, Africa is different from the United States, Henry. How we do things is completely different. Could it be that we're using the wrong playbook, especially when it comes to doing business? We want to replicate what has been done in developed nations, but you know we probably should do it our own way because it looks like in the chaos and all that bust and everything is where the opportunity lies and. For, 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 a, for a lot of startup founders you speak to, they will say to you, Nigeria or Nairobi, if you've been in Nairobi, there's no difference. There's so much corruption. There's so much everything. But the startup scene is actually buzzing. So it, it brings that contradiction that, you know, are, 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 are we using the wrong model or how is it supposed to be, basically? No, I, I agree. I mean... Um... You know, I, I, it, it is definitely different. I mean, we we cannot compare a country like the U.S. to a continent, right? It, it's it, it is bind to be different for sure. Um, but the the challenge is, you know, there there has to be, and and that's what's missing also in Africa is when you have African startups, you don't have the government behind you supporting. And I'm not talking about local support with the laws, the taxes. Those are great, but in the U.S., for example, and you know, if, if you export uh, a technology to Africa or Asia and all those things, there is agency, government agencies within the government that support those uh, um, entities, Initiative. those startups yeah. in in different areas. We don't see that in Africa. We don't see that. All you see a lot of a lot of problem I have with Africa today is we 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 trying to bring investors we try to bring international companies we have vehicles to do so to bring those guys to give them the red carpet treatment but we have no vehicle to 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 empower local startup to go beyond their borders right and that's what's mm -hmm. killing or yeah. one of the reasons it's killing the startup ecosystem and that's why you see you know uh um it's very extremely difficult for locals to compete with international it's just the reality you know you know um the time that we are allotted uh, on this podcast is never it will never be enough for us to touch uh, on all angles of uh, the startup scene uh it's almost like we need a part two uh, of this whole thing but I just want to ask you, uh, and this will probably be like um, a twofold question, and it probably in closing as well. Uh, firstly, uh, is there anything that can be done uh, from a regional or a governmental support, or even a private sector support, to support the scaling uh, of startups, or you know, or not even just the scaling, even just the mm -hmm. establishment of just startups? Because um, I mean all of us, all the three of us being entrepreneurs and founders of our own respective companies, we agree that startups are the, or entrepreneurship is, mm. is, is rather the future uh, in our continent if we're going to tackle all these problems. So what support can be available to these startups that are being established as well as scaling? Uh, and then uh, secondly, is the, uh, the appetite from a raising uh, capital perspective. Mm. Uh, actually, let me put in a third one. <laughs> are you <laughs> are you optimistic? What are your views uh, uh, about the scene, 
the, the startup world um, with regards to our continent? Well, I'll start with the last one because the last one is definitely optimistic. I mean, I've seen the trend. I used to say it all the time. Africa is the future. You see now more and more money coming in in Africa. I knew that was going to happen. I mean, just the demographic mm -hmm. alone, we're going to be close to 2.5 billion people in the next 30 to 40 years. I mean, the mm -hmm. number, you know, speak it for itself. So people are looking for opportunity. It has to look at Africa. And that's happening now. And it's going to keep growing. I don't see that trend slowing down anytime soon. But now the biggest challenge is, uh, you know, what do you do with all this youth? You're not going to find enough job for all those people, right? So entrepreneurship becomes the solution, right? But now entrepreneurship failure is is 90 in a 90 percentile. 90 percent of startups fail, right? Mm -hmm. But we're not really looking at the root of the problem, right? One of the things that government can do and should do is we need to enforce and pass laws that, for example, contractors. Do you know how much money uh, African governments spend on, on software development uh, in outside contracts, um, on, on importing, you know, staffing and all those things and having um, look at construction businesses and all? Yeah. There's so much money that is moving outside the continent because we don't trust ourselves. We don't <laughs> trust that the local guy can do the job yeah, of an yeah. international guy. I mean, yeah, literally, yeah, yeah, mindset, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't give a, I, I can't tell you how many times I hear stories of this agency uh, contracted an Indian company or European company, and you ask them, why not getting this small company Oh. They, they don't deserve this kind of money. I, literally, those, those mm, are words that yep, I've heard. Yep, yep. I've they heard say that. they don't deserve money I've, or experience. I've heard that. Oh, no, yeah. they don't deserve the money. He'd rather spend millions of dollars to a foreign company instead of giving to a local because he feel like that local is going to benefit, be rich, and him, him is... So we... we and I, I think it came from colonial time. I, I'll be honest with you. With I, you but, I think so. Uh, you know, we, we have this... We, I, and I don't want to get into that because that's that's a, that's a debate that never ends. But mm -hmm. literally, this is what's happening. We need to pass laws where at least 80% of all the contracts has to be fulfilled locally or regionally, but not mm -hmm. outside the continent, period. You can't tell me today in 2022, there is no company in construction or in software development or in any other uh, industry that can industry. be found locally or regionally. I don't believe that, you know. And then another thing we need to do is governments need to develop grant programs that are fully funded by them for research and development. That's what's killing Africa right now. And that's why we keep importing technology from outside, right? If you look at the budget on grants from the U.S. government alone, it's bigger than some of the total budget of some countries in Africa, right? Because they understand with that. And Israel, Israel is the perfect example of a small country that have unicorns, over 10 unicorns, and the yep. budget they spend on research and development got them where they are today, you know? So we, we need to really spend on, on research and development if we really want to be totally economically independent. Those are the key thing I would say that needs to be changed. That is Henry wow. Nyakarundi. I don't think there's anything I need to add right there. That's the perfect place to stop this, <laughs> but, this webcast slash podcast. Uh, merci. Uh, what, what do I say Dorian, in French Dorian. again? Merci, uh, mon frère. Is that correct? Yeah, Dorian, mon frère. Dorian. Dorian. <laughs> A bientôt. A bientôt. I think yeah. for me, it's Honestly, it's um, it's interesting to hear some of these things. We never talk about research as much. I've never seen mm. a national budget in my years of media where I've seen government uh, allocating money to research and development. And I know even universities, like uh, we have done projects before leaving universities in Africa yes. that you go back and wonder what happens to these projects actually? Does anybody ever develop them because you're getting students and and what are the universities doing anyway so i think that's a very key point to actually think think about not just also in the startups but in in other different fields like you yes. know health and uh, there's so much we could do 
And I think we are actually Absolutely. such a brilliant bunch of Africans that yeah, if, if we use our resources, there's a lot we can accomplish as a continent. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. And that's, how, that you, that's how you nurture yeah. talent. Yeah. That's how you nurture talent, you know. Um, you know, they, they, this this is we we the worst continent on nurturing talents because hey. our talent goes overseas because they don't get no, it's the reality. We have to be honest with ourselves if we want to change stuff. Uh, how many yeah. times you hear uh uh in sports in technology uh, in the US and Europe somebody blowing up but they left Africa they, they were struggling and all those things right <laughs> uh, no we we and but but nurturing talent is the foundation right and there's so mm. there's so much talent in Africa that's what that's what hurt me the most man I see I see so much talent that they just don't have a, a, a way out because we just don't know how to nurture talent but we'll see I mean I, I'm optimistic though I'm definitely optimistic that's good. That's good. That's a positive note to leave it. Folks, thank no, you for sure. tuning to this uh, to this episode. Uh, special thank you to my brother, Henry Nyakarundi. Truly, truly appreciate. And of course, my co-host, Maggie Mutesi. Please remember to visit our website, uh, Mansa Media Africa, for more news about the continent in case you missed anything. And please follow our social media pages. Uh, displayed at the bottom, Mansa Media Africa on Facebook and Mansa underscore media on Twitter. Also, Please subscribe to The Third Opinion, which is like a very small snippet uh, opinion letter that comes out every Friday with our uh, snippet of thoughts around what's going on in Africa or the world and how it impacts on our continent. I am Dumi Jere. Until the next time, here's to peace. To peace and profits. And profits. <laughs> Take care, guys.